Welcome back to Liberty Bites on the Think Liberty Network. I'm your host, William Gadsden. You can follow me on Twitter at William underscore Gadsden and follow Think Liberty on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever your favorite social media outlet is. You can also follow me on Facebook at William Gadsden Political Commentator. So give us a follow and a like for updates on new episodes and more. We also have a Patreon now, so if you'd like to support our work, check it out at patreon.com slash think liberty patrons. All right, so first and foremost, this is Liberty Bites' 100th episode. So I want to personally thank uh, all of you that have been listening in and continued to follow the show. Um, I just love seeing that that play ticker go up and up and up with each episode. So last couple of years, it's been two years already, has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. I hope you all have too. And we've got a lot planned for the future, some big stuff. But speaking of big stuff, today I want to talk about what is probably the most important bit of information that I can pass on to you all as far as the political system as it stands today. So I'm going to go through quite a few academic journal articles and some things like that. It's going to be a little dense, but stay with me here. This is an extremely important and, frankly, disturbing uh, piece of information that I think is very important that we all understand. So first of all, let's lay out the major players for what I'm going to be talking about this episode. So you've got the people. That's us, right? You've got the press, and then you've got the government. So government, in this sense, can be on the local, state, federal level, whatever. The concepts that I'm going to lay out here apply to all of the different levels. But the point being, government is acting, at least ostensibly, in your interest, in the interest of the people. But is that really the case? So let's dive in here. The first article I want to reference uh, is titled... Voters get what they want when they pay attention, human rights, policy benefits, and foreign aid. So this is a paper by Tobias Heinrich, Yoshiharu Kobayashi, and Leah Long from the International Studies Quarterly of March 2018. So essentially what this study breaks down is the idea of people pushing the government the people pushing the government to change different foreign policy stances based on uh, human rights violations uh, with countries that we are involved in, whether that be with sanctions or with foreign aid or uh, with troop deployments or offering protection or alliances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. So this study ends up showing that if a foreign government that we are involved in in a positive way, let's say we're sending them foreign aid, uh, if that foreign government commits human rights violations, then now it's up to us, the American people, to decide if that's something that we're willing to uh, sort of support, if you will. Obviously not directly, but if we're still giving them foreign aid, that's a bad look, right? So what this study found is that the only way the American people can respond to human rights violations is if the press reports it, okay? So, and then it also goes on to say that we're we're a pretty cynical and, and practical people. So if the foreign government is committing human rights violations, but at the same time is also giving us goodies, like we're sharing intelligence or uh, we're sharing military bases over there, joint training, etc. If if we are getting something out of it, Americans, then we're okay with overlooking some minor civil rights violations as long as we're getting something back. But the main point of this particular study that I want to drive home is that the American people can't react to these sorts of things unless we know that it's going on. And that's where the press comes in. So if the press is not reporting on these things, then the American people never know about it, and we can't hold our government and the actions of our government accountable. So tying into that concept, the second article that I want to go over is titled News Droughts, News Floods, and U.S. Disaster Relief by Thomas Eisensee and David Stromberg. Uh, Sorry, my dog's having a hissy fit in the background. From the Quarterly Journal of Economics from May of 2007. So this drives a similar point home. Basically, this is analyzing 
whether the U.S. will send disaster relief overseas to foreign countries. Uh, and do the American people push for that? Do they push their elected leaders to push for that? And this study found that, again, this is almost entirely based on uh, the news. Is the press pushing this news out there that there was a major disaster in a foreign country in the first place? And, of course, as you would expect, if mass media is not reporting on these things, then the American people don't really have any say in it in the first place. And then finally, to really drive this point home, there's an uh, important article called Press Coverage and Political Accountability by James Snyder Jr. and David Stromberg from the Journal of Political Economy, April 2010. So essentially this is the boiled down concept that I'm really driving home here is that the, the mass media, the press, is essentially the go-between between the American people and the American government. But that, unfortunately for us, sets the mass media in a position to be the gatekeeper for the information traveling between the people and the government and the government and the people. So if the press decides to not report on something or to put a certain spin on something, then we as American people, as American voters, are no longer informed decision makers. We cannot hold our own government, our own elected officials accountable unless the press decides to give us the information. Okay, so we've got, we've got the press, we've got the people, we've got the government. But let's talk about how the press acts, right? So ever since 2016, there's been this huge rage around fake news. And, of course, you know, we joke about it and we make memes because apparently that's how we uh, handle threats to our democracy. But we know that the mass media in general is not being responsible with the huge amount of power that it has as in acting as the gatekeeper between the American people and the government. And it shows in each one of these academic studies that I've gone over. And as I said, they are very dense, but I encourage you to dig into some of these, look at how they analyzed everything, how they got this information together and, and how they, they put it out there and published it. It is absolutely a proven fact that the media has an absolutely central point of control over the information, and it does sway the decisions of the American people and what they do to hold their government officials accountable. So we know there's fake news, yada, yada, yada. They're going to put spin on things. They're going to put bias on things. But what's a lot more devious is something that I want to cover in an article titled MSNBC and Daily Beast feature UAE lobbyist David Rothkopf with no disclosure, a scandalous media-wide practice. So this is by Glenn Greenwald from The Intercept. And obviously, uh, Mr. Greenwald's personal political biases aside, look at this article from the standpoint, he's, he's very angry in the article, but look at it from a standpoint of what actually happened instead of, you know, more of his colorful commentary. So essentially you have this man, David Rothkopf, who is absolutely part of the U.S. foreign policy elite, if you will. He's uh, been the editor-in-chief of foreign policy journals. He's been on the board of multiple uh, think tanks and research centers, uh, Columbia University School of International Public Affairs, uh, Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade Policy under the Clinton administration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This man is an absolute powerhouse. And so as a result of that, he gets invited onto MSNBC or CNN or any of these news outlets that are reporting on different things, and he is interviewed as an expert. He is someone that the viewers can trust, uh, whatever the information is that he's passing on to the viewers. But what isn't shown on that little byline below his name is that he has been receiving $50,000 a month, a month from the UAE. And the UAE is one of the closest allies of Saudi Arabia. So this is a man that is directly shaping foreign policy decisions by speaking to the people. And when the people get this information, they act on it by holding their uh, elected officials accountable 
and they want those elected officials to do what they believe is in their best interest. But these opinions are being directly shaped by this man that is being paid an exorbitant amount of money by a foreign government to essentially lobby the U.S. people and in turn lobby U.S. elected officials. And he is being paid to sway those decisions. Let's be clear. This isn't about uh, public relations or you know setting up any any sort of foundation or think tank or anything like that. He is getting six hundred thousand dollars a month from the UAE to him personally to Rothkopf personally, but that's not disclosed. And so the American people are trusting what they hear on TV from these experts because it's even to go a step further with this idea. It's not that. Well, yeah, I mean, Don Lemon, yeah, we know he's biased. We know what his agenda is. But this other guy, he doesn't work for CNN. So we can trust him, right? No. So as the article goes on, uh, Mr. Greenwald goes into using this, this Rothkopf individual as an example, but then goes on to list tons of other individuals that are in very similar places to, to shape uh, public opinion on foreign policy. That are that are all being paid by foreign governments to shape public opinion of American foreign policy. And we have no idea that it's going on. So this is specifically for the lobbying uh, by foreign governments of our own government. But you think the same thing isn't happening with public policy as well? You're crazy. Lobbying in public policy or domestic policy, excuse me, is far more wide-reaching than even even this, this case of uh, lobbying for foreign policy. So if this is going on on both sides of the fence with domestic policy and foreign policy, this is all being shaped by actors that absolutely have uh, other, other intentions, other personal agendas. They're literally being paid by people to shape public opinion and we have no idea that it's going on so this is what the the monolithic mass media has come down to they are bringing people on that have ulterior motives that do not have our best interest but they are shaping and affecting our public opinion and therefore our domestic and foreign policy as well but the good news is Ever since 2016, when we saw the polls, we saw that Hillary Clinton's going to win. Trump has like, what was it, like a 3% chance of winning, all of these different things. The trust in the mass media, this monolithic entity, started crashing big time. And we're seeing the descent, the death of mass media. And that's something we need to cheer on, to be quite frank with you. It's become so rotten to the core that we have all of these these players, these actors on the world stage shaping world events in our name, and they're moving us around like chess pieces. That's all going away. But at the same time, you also have another monolithic entity of social media, of Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that for the most part, do have major left leanings or authoritarian leanings. And they too are shaping, uh, shaping public opinion with what they choose to release on their front page, like with Reddit. Um, when they go in and change code and, and, or their algorithms or block quote unquote fake news because they're trying to, you know, uh, they're, they're trying to do something good. They're being altruistic. But instead, they're filtering information based on their own political leanings. So in a way, social media is, in fact, propping up mass media, and they're working together to continue what the status quo has been for so long. But thankfully, this is the silver lining, if you will. Mass media is slowly collapsing. It is dying, and social media can't do anything about that. We have people like uh, Ben Shapiro, Stephen Crowder, um, even some other independent leftist news sites like the Young Turks, even though they're, I mean, I've got my issues with them, obviously. Folks like Tim Pool. Tim Pool has done more uh, in the last year to call out mass media, to call out dangerous fake news, 
And he's bringing attention to these issues, and they are the ones that are going to be pushing this this paradigm shift from mass media, from social media, or excuse me, from mass media more into social media. But these are individuals, these are independent journalists for the most part that are using social media to push out the truth, or at least as close as we can get to it. These folks are far more open about who they are, what their leanings are, so at least we can go into it with a relatively informed decision and and a relatively informed filter to push through uh, everything that they're saying and say, yeah, you know, this this is a little bit more hyperbolic or this is probably isn't exactly what's going on or whatever the case may be. We are at least going into it with more of an open mind and making a more informed decision about the news that we are consuming. But again, you've got social media. There's this story uh, coming out recently about how Twitter terminated the account of an independent journalist because he was reporting on what they deemed to be fake news, but wasn't in, in fact come uh, ended up coming out as truth. But they ended up doubling down and deleting his entire account. So it is an uphill battle. But if we can mimic what folks like Tim Pool are doing, like Steven Crowder, like Ben Shapiro, and using social media to push out what's actually going on to fight against them with their own tools, I think that is how we are going to move forward here. But most importantly, for you all on an individual level, the most important thing you can do going forward to battle this is to, first of all, turn off turn off mass media, turn off CNN, turn off MSNBC, turn off Fox News, and watch some of these independent journalists, read some of the news stories that, are, that come up online from a myriad of different sources, and filter through all of the political BS. If they're saying, oh, well, we interviewed this expert, you know, Dr. So-and-so from this and this, look into that individual. Is he actually an expert? Does he have ulterior motives? Is he getting paid off by somebody else? What kind of ties does he have? This takes a lot of work on the part of the individual. I get it. We got, we got families. We've got jobs. We've got things that we're trying to take care of for us. Who has the time to do all of this extra work? But if you don't, then we fall into this same pattern that we have before of all of these actors moving us around like we're chess pieces on a board using us to meet their own ends, to meet their own agendas. That has to stop. That has to stop. We have to start getting real information from good sources, filtering through all of the BS, and then using that information to hold our politicians accountable, to make sure they are doing what is in our best interest and what we want them to do, because they work for us. But we have to tear down these these monoliths, these massive entities that have been leading us around by the nose for God knows how long. That's what we've come down to. So once again, thanks for listening. This is our 100th episode. Very excited about what we have in the future. Uh, obviously, comment, like, share. Hit that share button. Get this message out there. That is the next thing you can do, and it's probably the easiest thing you can do to help spread this message. I appreciate it. I hope you'll come back and become more liberty-centered with us next week. I'm William Gadsden with Think Liberty.